A hero is defined as a man of superhuman strength or courage. But such men are not born, they are made. And made to an exacting recipe. First, we must need a hero. If all is well with the world, such men will not emerge. Timing is everything. The more dire the circumstances, the more desperate the situation, the better. And finally, the man himself? The greatest heroes are the unlikely ones. Everything has to be just right. And that does not happen very often. He was the Marlon Brando, James Dean of the cricket world. It was very wild. Both of them arrived for the hearing with his solicitor. He was an anti-establishment hero. A man that enraged the old guard, of course. Returns to silence. Not just on the sport and field, but in real life. Yeah. 1981 was a, a tough year. England weren't any good at anything. He was written off. History tells this remarkable story. He's out. A one-off miracle. In the air, and six. A comic book boy's own story. That's it this time. <laughs> as unbelievable as Dunkirk. Another memorable victory for England. It did change my life. You know, most of it for the better. I first met uh, Ian in 1973. When we became friends, we got obviously contacts to play for Somerset County. He had this wonderful spirit about him that uh, energy and wow. He looked very thick and solid bones, and he loved the steak or two. At the time, his lamb chops and maybe a steak and kidney pie here and there. When I saw the physical stature of the individual, I said, hey, beefy, you know, and I think that has stuck up to this day. I had to make a decision that around the age of 15, um, between soccer and uh, cricket. It wasn't that difficult a choice, really. My father uh, sat me down and said, look, son, uh, well, I'll be honest with you, I think you're a better cricketer. And uh, luckily, I listened to him. I met him 24th of June, 1974. Uh, it was a Benson Hedges semi-final against Leicestershire. And my father was big friends of Brian and Viv Close, and Brian Close was then the captain of Somerset and invited us all down to the ground uh, to watch the game. But it was rain affected, they came off a bad light. So we went and joined them for drinks in the bar and that's when I first met Ian. He wasn't a permanent fixture in Somerset first 11. He'd, um, he'd had a great uh, quarterfinal and he'd hit the papers. Well, he was playing um, for Somerset against Hampshire at Taunton in a Benson Hedges Cup match, a one-day match, and um, the game was lost, really. He'd only played a few games for Somerset, never done much, really. And he w turned it round, basically, um, with some brave batting, but in the middle of this innings, he got hit by Andy Roberts, who was the most dangerous bowler in the world in, in 1974. And that's it. While swing across, Roberts collects his first wicket. Oh, and he was basically um, just tearing batsmen apart in, in county cricket. He demolished batsmen and sometimes he hurt them badly, you know, and some never actually came back. He and Bosun came into bat. This young upstart, as we, we used to call him in those days, because, you know, he was full of confidence. And, you know, I think I bowled him a short ball, and before he got into his strides, he got struck in, in his mouth. 
my surprise that he never he never went down and he continued batting and you know that, that literally took the game away from us yeah, nothing scared me you know, I was bulletproof uh, didn't worry about it four teeth well go to the dentist and get some more he spit in blood and all that and he went back he stood his ground and he had this burning desire to succeed at all costs you know and um, he had a talent that he was going to use as his asset. That was the sort of innings he would play in later years. Uh, you know, they had the sort of have a go hero, and it came off, and they won the game. And he was uh, he was 18, and he was a hero overnight. The success which he was having around him, that it attracted a lot of um, folks to him. Yes, you've decided the Grandstand Trophy should go to Ian Botham. Every time he went out, somebody always tried to make him a target. You could hear guys betting, oh, that's Ian Botham and what I can go and do, and I can go and stand on his feet and, you know, I can spill a drink over him and all that stuff, and they saw a potential superstar in town, and I guess we confronted a lot of that. Me and a club sitting on the night having a drink and all of a sudden the fella brought him. I said I wasn't gonna see anyone take advantage so I would basically hang back and, and do my stuff if it needs be you know and I said beefy leave it to me beefy leave it sit down I got it I said to the fella very politely we are having a quiet drink let us enjoy our drink don't spoil the night the next day, you could see all these guys with bruises and black eyes and everyone was coming to apologize and all that stuff. It was funny because I guess the tabloids um, uh, went to work with, um, with the actual events. It was um, a journey, not without bumps. But at the end of the day, uh, they say what you miss on the roundabout, hopefully you, you can gain on the straight. You know? <laughs> they were both 18 when they met in the car park of Leicester Cricket Ground. He asked her out for a Chinese meal, and that was pretty well that. Yes, we kind of decided to get engaged very soon after we met. Just 20, very young. But anybody who plays professional sport, their ultimate goal is to represent the country. And Ian was no different. But I mean, it never entered my head back in 74 when I met him that that would actually come about. England with Jeff Boycott back after three years are equally determined to hold on to their one test lead. And morale couldn't be higher with Somerset's Ian Botham raring to earn his first test cap. They were taking a chance on him in some ways. He was young and raw, but he had talent and they, England needed him. And most people coming into an England test dressing room as a rookie are very much in the background and they're seen and not heard. It's in the air and it's caught. Not with both and he was up to his pranks already, you know, putting uh, the red hot teaspoon that he just stirred his tea with on someone's bare thigh. Uh, that sort of prank Ian thought was very amusing. He got very bored very quickly. Didn't know what time it was. I haven't been to Trent Bridge many times to watch cricket. And this was the first and perhaps the only time I went to Trent Bridge. Not that it's not a lovely ground. And that's where he made his uh, debut for England. And I'd never seen him before then. We knew that he had a golden touch because his first test match wicket, the great Greg Chappell dragged the ball into his stumps. It wasn't a great delivery. And his golden first ball. Yeah, it was only against Australia. Both of them absolutely delighted. Oh, good catch. Well bowled, well bowled indeed. He started quite modestly by taking five wickets on his first day as an England player. There was a swashbuckling, glorious quality that footage can't quite convey. The enthusiasm, the appetite, the aggression, the laddishness, unquestionably.
There have been flamboyant cricketers, obviously, before. But this was an English flamboyant cricketer, sort of a contemporary kind of guy um, that didn't give a toss about anything. But there he was getting results. And he's got a chance this time, and he's gone this time. And a lot of England players were rather timid and playing selfishly. That all changed when Bosom arrived. England have tried to be defensive for a little bit too long in a lot of things they've done just recently. Not just in cricket, in soccer, in other games. And I think it was about time we attacked a little bit more and took the game to other people. Bowling, that's a good delivery. Ian came to the crease and he came into bowl and you expected results and, and you got them. That's a good shot, good shot. Botham was clearly someone who was a, f a figure to be taken account of. He had a, a style, a manner. Beautifully built young man. Ian Botham. Well, I always used to think when he walked to the wicket, he had a Union Jack on his backside. The all-rounder really was the thing that all the public wanted to see. You know, when he came on to bowl, something happened. When he came into bat, something might happen. <laughs> His career was phenomenal. First three years, um, he, he hardly put a foot wrong. He won England in numerous matches, and he, he did things that people hadn't done before. What a record this young man is establishing. He might make a very good captain, but if it were to impair his performance, then this would be something that selectors must weigh again. Can they afford captaincy to sap his concentration on his personal play? Speculation has increased today that Ian Botham will be succeeding Mike Brearley as England's captain later in the summer. We just finished a tour of Australia in 1979-80 with a match in India on the way back. Ian had played fantastically. There was about to be a series against the West Indies in England in 1980, followed by a tour of the West Indies in 1980-81. And I knew that I was retiring from cricket in 82, and that I wasn't going to be available to tour anymore, so I made that clear to people. When Brearley said he wasn't going to tour again, and therefore they were looking for someone new, the selectors said, this is the man we should make captain, because he hadn't done anything wrong to that point. His, his record was well-nigh perfect. The cricket captain's not like a captain in football or many other games. It's a really important role um, because he's on the field all the time when, you, when you're taking the field um, and he's setting the field and he's setting traps and he's keeping everybody awake and, and, and he's inspiring and alerting. And I mean, he's just the most important thing you can have. I didn't really think about it that much, actually. And then Breers and a few other people said, you know, we think you should take over at some stage, and I hadn't really gone and thought about it. You've got to hit the ceiling with it. Oh my God. The difficulty was that it meant Ian was made captain at the age of about 23, without having captained it against anyone else, uh, against the West Indies with the prospect of nine or ten test matches consecutively, and they were easily the best team in the world at that time. So he was really thrown in the deep end. seems to be the sort of uh, knee-jerk reaction. Here's a great all-rounder, let's make him captain. Next is Ian Botham, averaging no more than 13 for the series. I don't know how many times Ian Botham at that point had been a captain of anything. <laughs> we played England harder than anybody else. England have had their worst ever tour of the West Indies. If the head is bad, the rest of the body is going to suffer. The more of a thought is if you make the captain weak, the team is weak. So if the performances of the captain are not up to par, your press are the ones who slaughtered the captain. There's been growing pressure from some quarters for his removal as captain of England. I think the media must write that when, got, when it's raining, you know, they've got nothing else to do or something. The England party leaves for London tomorrow. After all the problems of the tour, they're hoping to get home without any more frustrations at Heathrow Airport. 
England's cricket team have arrived back from their disappointing tour of the West Indies, facing more problems when they were delayed for an hour at Heathrow Airport by the civil servants' industrial action. On the tour, they lost two tests, drew two, and one didn't take place. Most people struggle against the West Indies. Both of them struggled as captain because he wasn't a very good captain. He wasn't made to be um, a leader. He wanted to be one of the boys, and he never stopped being one of the boys. I didn't quite understand why you had to butter up someone and tell them they're the best thing since sliced bread to go out and play for your country. Um, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I was perhaps uh, not uh, the most tolerant of captains. The headlines in the papers now are vastly different from those a year ago, and Botham has still to register a test victory as captain. There are captains who could have led them better. I think more mature captains, certainly. Captains of greater experience. He'd been to comprehensive school. He was a sort of rough and ready lad. He... He did not fit the traditional mould. England had traditionally gone with captains who had either been to Oxford or Cambridge University or been to a public school. That was the normal thing. As the 70s gave way to the, to the 80s, England looked rudderless and pretty ineffective. You can see the disappointment on Botham's face. And of course, as soon as you start to go on to a little bit of a downward spiral with your own particular form and then the team not doing well, and the media start to um, take a lot more interest. Test cricketer Ian Botham has appeared at Grimsby Crown Court, accused of assaulting a Royal Navy apprentice mechanic outside a nightclub in Scunthorpe. And that was very, very difficult. His Mr. denied that he was a troublemaker. Mr. Rawley then put it to him that he had made up the whole sensational story about Botham to earn some money from the newspapers. Quite honestly, without a strong family behind you, I think anybody would struggle to get through those kind of times. And there's the man for whom the gods of cricket just don't seem to have been smiling. This uh, losing habit had become sort of terminal, really, because uh, we'd lost at home in 1980, we'd lost uh, abroad in 1981, uh, the beginning of the year, so the press were thinking that this was endemic now and when were England going to stop the rot and actually win or even draw a test match. The 1981 was a, a tough year. The 1970s had been very difficult economically and there was still a great deal to do to put things right. So they were very tough and lots of people were hurting in 81. This time. 81 was a horrendous time. There were the race riots going on in Toxteth. The Birmingham, Bristol, St. Paul's was gutted, fire. It was a terrible place to be in at the time. Everything was going wrong. You drive to grounds and you're seeing the smoke bellowing out from the night before. The Australians arrived in London this morning determined to win the ashes which they believe are morally theirs anyway. You know, what was the to, to give the nation a lift? Cricket, of all games, old-fashioned, silly old cricket, a five-day test, united for a short period um, the nation, even those who didn't really like cricket. There's no greater accolade as a professional sportsman than to be captain of your country. And um, I'm looking forward to it very, very much. Um, and I think the Australians are going to be a lot harder than the media seem to think. Because it's the ashes, you always have, first of all, that sense of anticipation. And secondly, that feeling, well, yeah, let's get this one right. It's the fiercest rivalry in cricket, I think, between two of the oldest cricket-playing countries. Whatever's happened beforehand, 
the moment you start an Ashes series, the first test of an Ashes series, you think, right, this is the one we want to win. He's gone. Myself and Hugh Laurie and others, we were sharing a house and we were watching the disastrous opening of this series where Ian Botham had been appointed captain. It was not a happy sight. Direction and length has all been lacking and that really just about sums it up. England lost and crucially England lost through their own fault. Really. They dropped catches, they bowled poorly. He's got... Nothing will go right for that man. So it was all falling apart, really. My family feel the pressure a little bit more than I do. That whole environment for him was totally alien to him. Because most things in life that Ian believes you can be in control of, well, he, he couldn't control that situation at all. I think I'm improving all the time as a captain, and uh, hopefully if I come into a little bit more form, then uh, that'll shut my critics up. That's close. He's got him. Lawson has dismissed the England captain. And things could hardly be going worse for Ian Botham at the moment. And I'm afraid that's just not good enough. Oh, the fates follow you. Prepare for the England captain. It was a bit of a shambles, really. England's struggle. I mean, it's a draw, but it's a messy draw. LBW. The main recollection most people will have of that was that he scored naught in both innings and received a very bad reception when he returned to the pavilion after his second duck. The ground was silent and I just thought, you, oh, this is just horrendous. The spectators showed their approval by absolutely not, not clapping, not even looking up when he left. And we knew then that probably he had to go as captain this picture was uh, taken the second test at Lord's when he just made that duck in the second innings. And you can see he's holding his bat to the ground. He's obviously pretty unhappy with life. Nobody even put their hands together for the England captain uh, on his way back. Returns to silence. That icy silence that he received was as symbolic of the contempt they felt for him as a man and their distrust of him. And it was a horrible moment, absolutely horrible. The members are, are really trying to avoid his, his, his gaze. Um, there's this guy here, he's filling his diary or his scorecard, who knows. Um, this one here is making, all three are making it absolutely clear. They're not looking at both of them. <laughs> it's, that really rankled with Ian, and um, I know for a fact that he, you know, I don't think he ever acknowledged the uh, Lord's uh, members after that in any shape or form. They're a tough bunch, that lot. Something had to be done. Clearly, both um, the captaincy was not suiting his freestyle of play, and um, either he was going to be dropped from the entire team, but probably he was going to be dropped as captain. And, well, history tells this remarkable story. Over these last few months, he's had a rough time. I mean, his family has been harassed, everything's been harassed. So, so we felt that uh, it would be a good thing, perhaps, to, to give him a rest for a few matches, from captaincy, that is, and uh, let him get back into the groove again. Who do you think will be the new captain, then? I don't know. I, I, Who would you choose? I, well, in my view, the bloke... Th the captain that I feel is the best captain in this country and uh, has been, uh, who I did play a lot of cricket under, and that's Mike Brearley. They came to ask me, and I think in some ways that was good for Ian because he and I got on well, and I was in no way a rival to him, of course, not in the slightest. Um, and I'd been his first captain for England, so I think it was easier for him to climb down and feel more or less OK about it than it would have been if somebody else had been selected. It was a good thing that he gave up the captaincy um, because the pressure on us as a couple, it was, it was, it was driving us apart, to be honest. He, he came home and we, we just sat all night and spoke and he felt so relieved, you know, I, 
I, I could see that there was um, a, a difference in his whole attitude, like there was this burden which was lifted off his shoulders. He decided that if England would still have him, he wants to play for them, that he would prove everybody wrong. It was the best thing probably that happened to me, uh, as it turned out, and pretty good career move resigning. This series is going to be very close, and I think it's one that the public are going to enjoy very, very much. Thanks very much, Ian. Good luck. Thank you, Bill. I mean, when you change a captain in mid-series, it usually means there's trouble of some sort about, and I think it certainly diminished expectations. So what happened was an even more wonderful surprise than it otherwise would have been. Shot. And we're just watching every moment, hoping things are going to cheer up because, you know, we were 1 0 down and things didn't cheer up. The first two and a half days of that game, first three days of that game, went pretty badly. Oh, he's put him down. Australia made a very presentable score. Good shot. That's. Oh, no! We went in first innings and. We weren't very good. Close, yes. And... Frankly, I, I felt like going home. And he's out, caught behind. We were out for a pretty miserly score, well over 200 runs behind. And he's out. So it was a feeling of some despair, I think, that most cricket lovers had on that Saturday. Hold him, that's well bowled by Lawson. We were score. in a really bad state. We were all out for 174 and had to follow on, and Graham Gooch was already out that night. And that's a catch, and a beautifully taken catch by Terry Alderman, diving to his left, and Graham Gooch is out for North, and England really are in great disarray here. And then there was a Sunday off, and, uh, you know, the situation was dire. <laughs> well, once the team's following on, it means uh, demonstrably that there are a couple of hundred runs behind on the first innings, the probability is that they're going to lose a game. It is very, very, very rare in cricket, and even rarer in test match cricket, for a side that has had to follow on so many runs behind its opponents to actually save a game, let alone win it. By the time uh, Saturday evening came, with a rest day in that particular test match, uh, we all probably thought the, the game was up. Well, Ladbrokes clearly did with their odds of 500 to 1 on the old electronic Headingley scoreboard. The 500 to 1 odds for England were a sort of token gesture almost by the bookies, I reckon, just to say, you know, this is how ridiculous it is. England are dead and buried, but if you want to go, that's what they are. But it doesn't matter, you know, they won't make it. I mean, one looked at it and one saw no reason to suspect that something truly remarkable was going to happen. There was absolutely no reason to suspect. Sunday was the day off, so on the Saturday evening we had our annual barbecue. Sometimes I feel I've got to run away. I've we went to Ian Botham's for a party. Um, and it's one of those parties where if you can remember it, you weren't really taking part in it properly. A few, a few glasses of wine and, and things. It's fair to acknowledge that we weren't really expecting to get out of the hole that we were in in terms of that game of cricket. So everybody was totally relaxed. And by the time we got up on the Monday morning, everyone said, well, we might as well check out the hotel because we've got very little chance, realistically, of surviving the day. Oh, straight through him. I mean, a crowd failed to turn up. Um, I turned up probably with minimal equipment. It was ready to go home atmosphere. And for most of that Monday, we did struggle. So for most of that Monday, it looked as though it was a good decision and we would be slinking away with our tails between our legs. But that's close, yes. I'm afraid he has to go LBW again. I spent the morning rather predictably looking at England doing badly. And then, of course, when Botham comes into bat, you do perk up. Whatever happened, if he's out first ball, middle stump knocked out, that would have been a great photo because that's almost what you're expecting. 
Yeah, what a triumph for him it would be if he could still be batting at six o'clock this evening. You know, he had a bit of a swipe and heave, and he thought, well, good old Beefy, you know, this is, might make a picture. Lovely shot. You watch Ian Gard to bat, um, the way he plays, probably doesn't take you long to come back saying, well, let's watch this anyway. Oh, beautiful show, beautiful show. I actually sat with the Australian wives and uh, Jane Border said, oh, Bob's getting a few runs. I said, oh, thank goodness for that. I said, I'm sorry, girls, but thank goodness for that. You know, we had a laugh about it. More runs came about. You think, oh, hang on a minute. Safely over the top of Hughes's head. He started to bat more and more freely, and it became an extraordinary sight. Oh, now it's four needed. It was a hitter's innings. I mean, it, sometimes it was pure village green. And absolute thoroughbred strength. You know, once I got to 50, I thought we can get, make them bat, just, just don't lose by an innings. He looked imperious, all the cliches, he looked in charge. He looked as if he was having fun. There was a few thick edges, there were a few thin edges, but they went in the right areas, and I got away with it. And there is the 100 partnership. And then I went and joined Mum and Dad and Ian's Mum and Dad. The atmosphere there, absolutely unbelievable. But they're looking for that, let alone chasing it. It's gone straight into the confectionery stall and out again. We suddenly thought, well, at least we're not going to be humiliated. At least, at least Australia's jolly well going to have to bat again. That's something. We were used to them winning by an innings. Safely away right before. That's a splendid 100. The way he scored the runs and the belligerent manner in which he completely crucified the Australian attack um, was one of the great things to behold. I'll never forget it. You know, you hope the guy was going to come good and he's going to, you know, do the turnaround again. He obviously had the, the chutzpah to be able to do that. Australia needed uh, a sum which was not gigantic, but at least there was a total posted because of this remarkable innings from both of them. He was written off. Quite a few of his colleagues had written him off as well. He thought, I'll show them, I'll come back. Mm. And he did. There's a couple of Australians in the background there looking probably a little less happy than they were in the first thing that morning. He's gone from being you know, zero to hero, as they say. 145 not out. He came to the wicket when England were in dire straits at 105 for five. It has been a phenomenal innings. Now for today's good news, here's David Icke with Tales of a Hero Returned. Yes, indeed, how fortunes can change in sport. Ian Botham, relieved of the England cricket captaincy after a year. Even then, the expectation was that the Australians would win by five or six wickets. Australia needed 130 to win. Not many runs, is it? If I remember rightly, they got over 50 or so. They were 50-odd for one. They needed 60-odd runs with nine wickets. They didn't factor in RGD Willis on a mission. It really was a difficult delivery. He's gone. And there was Bob Willis, who had a very extraordinary demeanour, eyes like pistols in the snow, stand there looking furious, a mop of curly hair, but, but he could steam in. Bob Willis was quite down, hadn't been selected initially for this match, was not very fit, uh, had lost his role as the strike bowler, as the opening fast bowler. Bob Willis was very keen to bowl, but really said, no, 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 no not yet. He wanted to get him angry. And, and he was already very angry because he'd been written off in quite a few of the papers. Yeah, there was a lot of tension there. Uh, you know, saving one's international career, probably number one. Um, proving the selectors wrong for originally leaving me out of the side. 
and obviously giving two fingers to the uh, press and media. The standard of journalism in this country has gone down the nick completely. People have to rely on small-minded quotes from players under pressure for their stories where they used to write about cricket. They don't seem to be able to do that anymore. You can just see that in him. And finally, uh, Brilly threw him the ball. And we said to him, bowl fast and straight. Oh, what a good catch. <laughs> he just bowled as if he was in a trance. Oh, good catch. Super catch, out. And to this day, you watch him bowl and you can see his eyes are somewhere else. There's no high fives, there's no running around, slapping each other on the back, he was gone. That day, he was possessed. He's got a touch on it, he's gone. All he wanted to do was bowl, bowl, bowl. In the air, Dilly's underneath it. And he's got it! A very, very good catch indeed. Oh, what a good catch. And Lily has miscued it to mid on. One. <sighs> Bowl him, it's all over, and it is one of the most fantastic victories ever known in Test cricket history. Both of them, in different ways, were almost on their cricketing knees, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, come two performances that rank with the best that cricket has ever seen in all its long history. It was uh, as unbelievable as Dunkirk. It came at the perfect time, not just for us as a team and myself as a player and Bob as a player, but it came at the right time for the country. They needed something. People don't spend their lives being fascinated by Clause 17 of the Social Security Number 2 Bill, but they are fascinated by great sporting events. And of course, a great event like that lifted the whole nation. Yeah, gripped the whole country. Not a shadow of doubt about that. Well, let's take a break from politics for a moment. Something happened at Headingley today that was so splendid. It seems a pity to leave it to the end of the programme. It was such a remarkable win for England that it even had the hard men of Newsnight jumping up and down. And the city markets were practically brought to a standstill. After we won Headingley, it definitely got to the Aussies. They twitched. They thought that, uh, you know, this was a one-off miracle, a sort of comic book boy's own story that couldn't possibly happen again. Hold him. Botham restored his confidence and his conviction and his disinhibition. I didn't go to Edgbaston because I had one of the uh, Pete Denning's wife, Annie, and her two daughters came to stay with me. And it was a glorious day. Yeah! We were in a very bad state in that match and looked almost certain to lose it. Lily is gone. We had all the kiddies in the paddling pool in the garden and everything, and, and Annie was, she was the one who had the, the cricket on. They only did 151 to win on a, on a better pitch than the Headingley pitch. He's helped. LBW. And she said, oh, Both just got another wicket, you know, and I said, oh, great. And there's Boldu. And there it was, um, Ian Botham who took five wickets for one run when the match was almost lost. You know, then she came, she said, you're going to have to come and watch this. It's just going through the film, you see. He grabs a stump and another memorable victory for England. We went to Old Trafford and it, we steamrolled them. That was a pretty good Saturday afternoon, to be honest, at Old Trafford. It was remarkable. That was Botham's finest innings in my eyes. Old Trafford was simply 
Bertham at his best as a batsman. It was a simply outstanding performance. A, 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 a one of the truly great innings. And uh, that drew all of an end of the trap. He demolished the Australians psychologically. They just wilted underneath his assault. In the air for six. It was Australia running scared. He went from being the person that everyone reviled by being the captain that resigned, who got the double duck at Lords, into the hero. And established him into the annals of folklore. Botham's Ashes, as that whole series was called, it was a moment of glory for him. Genuine glory. England win the series three to one with two draws. It was Ian Botham who just about won three matches on his own. That marvellous century at Headingley. And then he went on to Edgbaston where he took five for one in that spell that uh, knocked over the Australians for that ridiculously small total. And then another century up at Old Trafford. I really haven't seen anything like it in all the time I've been watching cricket. They had one hand and four fingers on the Ashes urn and he wrenched it from, from Australia. For Ian, it was a, a massive springboard. Um, you know, from having had his stock at pretty much zero after two games, you know, it had risen massively by the time that series had finished. And that was, that was the catapult for Ian, I think, to you know, take that innate self-belief of his to new heights. It did change my life. He has resuscitated cricket as a national game by his performances throughout the year. He is now in India and is Ian Botham. Things changed considerably after that. He is our greatest all rounder. Well, it made him iconic. Pull! Ian Botham. Ian Botham. Yeah, the bloke in 146 wants three shredded wheat. Three? He was the biggest sports star in England. Three. Initially, it's, it's exciting, and, but then everybody wants a, a piece of him. How can you play this game for five days and have a draw? If you just started watching it tomorrow, by the end of the test match, you'd be a little bit wiser. The children were growing up, you know, um, starting school, wanted them to have the feet on the ground. And by them having the feet on the ground, I certainly had to have my feet on the ground. And sometimes I had to kind of pull in. I felt I had to pull him back down occasionally. We obviously had a really really privileged upbringing and we met some fantastic people um, over the years. Liam and I had Elton John babysit for us once um, and I think Elton bought me my first ever ever proper watch. Meeting Eric Clapton and going around cleaning his Ferrari. You know, as a kid being allowed into the England dressing room, you know, how many kids do that now? You know, I lived in an England dressing room when Dad was there because no one was had the balls to turn around today and say, Dad, you, you know, your son shouldn't be here. It made him. and it sort of broke him as well. For Ian, you know, nothing is ever straightforward, is it? Nothing is ever simple. He believed the myth of Ian Botham more than anyone. He thought all I have to do is, you know, swing the bat, have a, have a go and it'll come off. And it meant it was a justification for not practising hard. Whereas it could have been just a glittering career from then on in. That's close, my word, that's close. No, says Rex Whitehead, both of them says, dear, oh dear. Um, there were other things, it seemed, came to the attention of those that watch. What's gone wrong? Is it technique or temperament? Is he too fat, too unruly? Doesn't he practice? Oh, he's bowling right through the gap. Jeff Lawson uh, doing the trick once again. 
Two years ago, Ian Botham almost single-handedly won the Ashes for England with a series of unbeatable performances with both bat and ball. This winter, he's been a shadow, in one sense, of his former self, with the result that England have struggled throughout. There was no chance of him repeating what he'd done in 81, but people expected him to. Uh, and, he f and he didn't do it, and England lost the series. And he was a grave disappointment. Ball by ball, over by over, the Australians humiliated our best all-rounder. Well, no marks for Ian Botham for that. I guess it didn't take, what, more than three years or so before the, um, you know, the papers were looking at him from a different angle uh, and on a different page. Show, show. It was very wild for, for a while. Um, kind of lost a bit of discipline. I remember trying to put him to bed one night. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, you've got to play tomorrow. Go to bed. We both like to drink. But England's cricketing superstar smoked marijuana. He says he's issued a libel writ against the other players was putting more effort into that. There was tabloid wars going on, the bull, the bull that was flying around. Um, some of the stuff I just sat there and thought, well, how the hell do I ever play cricket? Ian Botham says allegations that he smoked cannabis are totally untrue. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Um, and uh, going up to my children, what's your dad eat, what's your dad drink, and stuff like this. I'll get a life. Go away. Off the field, too, Botham's short fuse has got him into trouble. He was arrogant. He made a lot of mistakes with the press and probably did some stuff that he shouldn't have done. It just seems everything I do, people are going out of their way to try and knock down. Ian Botham and his wife, Cathy, were arrested at their home on New Year's Eve on suspicion of alleged drug offences. Do you believe it? <laughs> I don't believe it. At the end of the day, he, he was a boy from Taunton come in and he suddenly he was, you know, a world-famous person. If you're involved in something and you read, you think, well, I know that's not true. But if your family's 10,000 miles away, it can be a little bit awkward. But how much of it is your own fault, do you think? Oh, no more than 70%. <laughs> the lowest point I've seen him would have been when, I guess, all the stuff in the Caribbean here would have hit the, the fan and um, the way it would have uh, affected his family. Ian Botham has been talking about the sex and drugs allegations made against him by Lindy Field, a former Miss Barbados. She claimed they'd had an affair during the test series and had taken cocaine together. It was difficult and there were certain times when I think having a go at me personally or and questioning our relationship, our marriage. So you didn't go to bed with that? I would like to think I have far better taste than that. It was just unbelievable. I think um, we were front page news, you know, front page news, and front page news not just of the tabloids, but of the, some of the broadsheets as well. Mm. I mean, it's just unbelievable. We had bushes moving outside the house, and when you sort of looked into it, it was, some, it was a photographer disguised as a bush trying to get photos, and, you know, there's times where you knew that people were being, you know, being set up and women would jump out and it'd be a snap photo. you think, what, what was that? And then it's gone and then it's in a newspaper, but we were very much shielded from that. She's the rock of the family, without a shadow of a doubt. She's a very, very strong woman, um, and what she's been through, not many people would have done. And I've got the utmost respect. You know, I love my dad to bits as a, as a, as a father and, and as a brother. But he, he'd be a nightmare to live with. And, you know, you've got to give my mother a big medal for that. I think she's branded herself. And it's, it's no secret to people that know her, apparently, as it's coming out. So it's now a case of us uh, putting it all together and uh, painting the true picture of Miss Lindy Field. England begin their fourth test against the West Indies in Trinidad tomorrow. Morale amongst the English players is said to be low. And now there's been new allegations about Ian Botham and drugs. We have that tour selection meeting, and it's safe to say that not everyone was convinced that Ian Botham should play the next test match. 
And that sounds extraordinary, doesn't it? You think about Ian Botham, who he was, the player he was. It wasn't the first time I'd had to defend him. It wasn't the first time I'd had to say, well, look, you know, Ian Botham is Ian Botham. He does things that other people don't. And when he does them well, he does them far better than other people. And that's what you have to remember. By 1986, pretty much the end of the West Indies tour, the sort of controversial and fairly disastrous West Indies tour of 1986, he finally had to admit that he had in the past taken drugs. Today's papers are speculating that this will be the end of Botham's astonishing career as a test cricketer. Well, I didn't use drugs. I smoked marijuana once. Uh, once or twice in my late teens, early 20s. This was something he denied pretty vehemently for two years. Fairly quickly, the cricket establishment said, you know, you're out, mate. And he was banned for two months. But it, what he did actually do, funnily enough, was sort of cement him as an anti-establishment figure, which he'd always been, really. And after that, he was an anti-establishment hero. If all is well with the world, such men will not emerge. The more dire the circumstances, the more desperate the situation. We're going to make a few mistakes along the way. If you continue to do and you don't learn from those mistakes, well, you have every right to, to, to go through what you go through. When you're quite willing to, to make the changes and to do the necessary things to move on, it's a great achievement. He did sail very close to the wind on many occasions. You have to do something if the public opinion is kind of turning against you or journalists are turning against you. His first charity walk took place when his reputation was going through a rocky period. It all started in 77 after playing at Leeds when I broke the bone in my foot and went uh, to the hospital and uh, our surgeon took me through to the physio department. I said to David, I said, what are these boys doing here? And I said, uh, they look all right, fine. What, are they just mates visiting? He said, no, they've got uh, a thing called leukemia. And I didn't even, I'd never heard of this disease. In layman terms, it's cancer of the blood. And I said, well, they look fine. He said, well, sadly, they won't be here very shortly. There's not much more we can do for them. In terms of other people's needs, he's always uh, been alive to the needs of other people, particularly people less fortunate than himself. And that memorable visit to the leukaemia ward in that hospital certainly clicked something in his brain. I was going to the hospital every day and I saw these kids disappear. I thought, this is, this is crazy, and what can I do? And we used to go walking all the time uh, up in the Lake District over Easter and what have you with the, all the dogs. So I said, right, I'm going to do a sponsored walk. The first walk from John the Great's Land's End was, you know, a triumph, really. Ian Botham was batting for youngsters like these, leukaemia patients in London's Great Ormond Street Hospital. Have you got any message, any advice for him? He better wear springs on his feet. seems some doubt. Do you not think you'll be able to make it? Uh, I'm sure you will. I think it's a pretty good cake from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell him to say that? No. <laughs> Shut up, boy. <laughs> the biggest thing for me was to see the people when dad first started and a couple of them who were seriously ill um, with leukaemia then to be able to come onto the walk and enjoy join it with dad. You know, they're sort of my age now. Well, I was in hospital comes sort of the end of my treatment, about four or five months, the end of it, and um, it was all over the papers that Beefy was starting off in, uh, in John O'Groats and making his way down, down the country. He was the guy that was, was smashing the balls around. He was the one that sort of said what he thought about things. And then I turned around and sort of said to my mum and dad, uh, 
I'd like to go and meet him. And um, we went along for the day, got introduced as he was walking along, and he said, well, come on, you're walking with me now. Grace was diagnosed with um, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. She was just three. In those days, the chance of survival for the most common form of childhood leukaemia is 20%, so it's basically a death threat. You, you just had no chance, and it was awful. The amount of uh, research that's been able to happen just because of the money that he's raised has been absolutely phenomenal. The amount that he's put into it and the dedication he's put into it means that children like Grace go on to lead a normal, happy, healthy life. My sister was born on the first ever walk um, back in 1985. I like her. So it's been a part of us. Um, friends and family are all the crew. I think this is the number 14 or 15 walk coming up. Cricket was my target initially, and I was uh, pretty selfish, really, about that in many ways because the dressing room saw more of me than the family. Uh, but now we can actually do it as a family, this, the second phase. Uh, so we've gone from the cricketing family now to the, the leukaemia lymphoma. I organise it, I walk as much as I, as I can. Um, but yeah, we'll just keep on going. She's almost one year post-treatment. She leads a wonderful life. The survival's gone up into the 90s for the most common form of childhood leukaemia. It doesn't surprise me at all that a man who was born with so many gifts should use those gifts to help other people. 26 years now, we'll just keep doing it every two years. To think that he's done this from walking into a hospital is just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. What, what, what an achievement. Had it not been for Syrian, it would be a completely different story for us today. So I think we'll be forever grateful for everything he's done. No praise is too high for those efforts. And the Leukaemia and Lymphona Research Fund really appreciate that. To think that these children that go along on these walks now sort of have to ask their dad who he is, it's just unbelievable. Effectively, he's a legend. Let alone chasing it. I went up to his home and he took me in the back room and we just laughed, you know. It's, it's, and he pushed me in my chest and he said, Could you imagine this? <laughs> Two scumbags in those days, you know. I gave him the privilege of being called sirs, you know. And we just laughed. The man with the self-belief, the man with the ability to say, I'm going to win this now, is the man who comes out on top. And for so much of Ian's career, he had that ability and timing to do that. <laughs> well, now he really is going to go. He smashed that miles. It's gone way over the top of each square leg. over and he's hit that one straight down the ground a magnificent batting performance by one of the greatest all-rounders of all time that's it this time he's made sure he's dating five if i was out there in the middle enjoying myself then hopefully the guys who've paid the money to come and sit in the stands to watch it uh, are enjoying it as well and it uh, really wasn't any more complicated than that I don't think I can name three people I admire as much or who've given me more sheer pleasure than Sir Ian Terence Beth. Mike Brayley tells the story of the 1981 Test Series against Australia. Archive on Radio 4 this Saturday at 8.